All right, welcome everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. I see some nods. That means like we're doing all right. So, uh, thank you for all coming out tonight to uh, the Leon County Rural Economic Development Forum. Uh, I'm Artie White. I'm with the Tallahassee Leon County Plan Department. I will be moderating tonight. So. Uh, my goal is to not talk a lot, um, but actually help facilitate the conversation between uh, everyone here and our, our panelists. Uh, before we get started, I do want to uh, first acknowledge that we do have uh, Jody Wilkoff with the uh, Chief of Staff for Commissioner Miner's office. Uh, so always appreciate when we have representation from our elected officials uh, here to kind of hear the conversation from the community. Uh, I also want to thank the Leon County Board of County Commissioners uh, for coming up with this idea. Um, so this is something that the, the board came up with, and uh, I think this will be a really good and productive conversation. I uh, also want to take a moment to thank the panelists for showing up and uh, being willing to share their knowledge with everyone uh, and be willing to have a conversation with the community. Uh, I want to thank uh, County Communications for recording this. Uh, and. Um, in a few weeks, uh, we should be able to like push this out, and uh, if you want to go back and see something, or uh, if you know someone who would be interested in seeing this, there will be a video uh, that they can look at in the future. Uh, but I also want to thank each of you for coming out. I know that sometimes coming out in the evenings um, to participate with your government, to hear different things, can be a challenge. Uh, you know, People want to eat dinner, they have kids that they're taking things to. So I, I recognize that sometimes it's a challenge, uh, but thanks for taking time out of your lives to come uh, and be a part of this. Tonight we're talking about economic development in the rural areas. Um, essentially, we were asked by the Board of County Commissioners to uh, host a citizens engagement series uh, session on the unique business opportunities uh, in the rural areas of our community. Uh, this is a really important topic. Uh, I looked at the official zoning atlas we have uh, and 66% of our county is rural. And so we're talking about more than half of our community being rural. And it's really important that we actually have a conversation about the resources and the opportunities that 66% of our county offer us. So our panelists today will talk about the, uh, the values that the rural areas bring to our community and the unique opportunities that rural areas have uh, here in Leon County. Uh, I will introduce the panelists one at a time uh, they each have about a 10 to 12 minute presentation, uh, and then once everyone does their presentation, uh, we'll open it up for some question and answers uh, to really engage with everyone else. So, uh, Our first panelist is Neil Fleckenstein. Uh, he is the Red Hills Planning Coordinator for Tall Timbers Land Conservancy. Uh, for the past 17 years, Neil has been responsible for community planning activities and issue-based advocacy efforts to ensure the sustainability of Red Hills region of North Florida and Southwest Georgia. Neil has also served as a manager for a number of projects, including the Red Hills and Albany Quail Lands Economic Impact Analysis Project, the Red Hills Economic Valuation and Ecosystem Services Project, and the Red Hills Cost of Community Services Project. Uh, with that, I will uh, welcome Neil. Hey, folks. Um, Artie, I'm, I'm not a behind the podium kind of guy. Does this come off? Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So, um, Artie is going to talk about this, uh, this project that we just wrapped up, which is the uh, economic impact analysis of uh, the quail lands um, in the Red Hills region. Now, I don't know how familiar folks are with, uh, with the Red Hills. I know some of you live in the Red Hills in terms of northern Leon County. So I need to do a very quick uh, kind of overview, geographically speaking, of where we're talking about. Um, Red Hills region basically extends from the Buckley River in the west to the Osceola River in the east and south to the Cody Scarp, which we're basically almost on the Cody Scarp right now, um, and then north, just north of, uh, of Thomasville. And if we're getting too much feedback, let me know if I need to be someplace or the other. Can you point to the Cody Scarp? I'll take care. Uh, the Cody, oops, no, I don't know if I can. Uh, the Cody Scarp is basically a US 20s, I'm not really getting up. It's the US 27, basically. Okay. So kind of in, uh, in here. Uh, so within that Red Hills region, you've got about 435, 440,000 acres uh, of land, much of which is held in these large historic quail hunting properties. Um, we've got about 150 owners of these larger properties in the Red Hills. 
Uh, and interestingly, about 40% of it right now is, uh, is under permanent conservation. So from a conservation perspective, this is probably one of the better success stories in the nation of, of private land uh, conservation. Um, historically, it's important to understand that the, the pattern of land ownership there comes from the mid to late 1800s, post-Civil War, we had a lot of land owners from the north and from the Midwest coming down to enjoy the winters down here, which were a heck of a lot nicer than the winters up in Boston, New York, Cleveland, etc. And they pretty quickly found that they could buy land down here for pennies on the dollar. So a lot of them bought these very large quail hunting properties. Uh, and by 1870, 1880, we kind of saw the land, the land ownership patterns that we have here basically established. And a number of these properties literally go back to the same ownership from 1870, uh, 1880 or so. Um, what they were most passionate about was quail hunting, and they spent, frankly, a, a significant amount of money doing so. So what I was really surprised about is with all the ecological knowledge that we have about the region, up to five years ago, we had no idea what the economic impact was of these properties. So in 2013, I did the first economic impact analysis of, of quail hunting properties, just to answer that question of what is the economic impact associated with this land use. So I did a, a survey back then, and we updated this uh, throughout uh, 2018. So this is about as current information as you're going to get uh, on any project. So for, for this project, I surveyed 111 landowners. Those folks owned 136 properties. And to give you a sense of the size, the average size of each of these is about 3,000 acres. So while we did have some smaller properties that we talked to, you know, 100 or 200 acres, it ranged from there up to about 17,500 acres. Average size is right at 3,000 acres. So some pretty big, big, pretty big chunks of real estate. Um, the owners of 75% of that land mass responded to the survey, um, which I don't. Did I do that? Hello. Thank you. Um, which, from a survey perspective, anybody who does survey research knows 75% is a pretty good, pretty good response rate. Uh, the way we got that response rate was basically. Every landowner that was in the survey, um, we assigned one of our board members or some other person that we're affiliated with to a landowner and they berated them until they returned the survey. And that's a really effective way to do a survey. Uh, it, was, it was an anonymous survey because we, were asked, we asked ridiculously probing questions that if I asked you in a survey, you would, you would tell me where to go. Um, but what's amazing was despite the fact that it was anonymous, Fully 25% of the surveys that I got said, hey, this is Bob at Joe Blow Plantation. Call me if you got any questions about this. Here's my budget, which just kind of blew my mind. But I think that was a function of the fact that you know, we had a 50, 60 year relationship with a lot of these landowners. So from a data perspective, it was, it was crazy good in terms of the data that we got back. Um, the things that we were asking about in the survey was basically every single aspect of what it takes to run kind of a world class quail hunting property. We wanted to know every single aspect of their operating costs, how much they spent on you know, payroll, housing, buildings, etc. cetera, um, their capital improvements in terms of major equipment purchases, building construction, you, you name it. And if you think about the size of some of these properties, again, 10, 12, 14,000 acres, they're like small cities. So their budgets look exactly like the budget of a small city, right? I mean, they're buying two or three tractors a year, or three or four trucks a year, and, you know, they have a, a capital improvement budget in terms of roads, water, you know, you name it. So it's, it literally is just like a, the budget you would see for a small, uh, small city. Um, we also asked about discretionary spending, which is really fun when you ask a lot of really rich people about their discretionary spending. Um, I got some great comments about that, but frankly, most people said, okay, that's, that's, that's within bounds. And they would tell me we spend on the average between X and Y, because all that's important, again, from, from an economic development perspective. So, kind of the bottom line, and I know we have a real short time frame, so someone just scream when I need to be finished. Um, what we found in the 2018 study was the total economic impact of those quail hunting properties was about $194 million. Six minutes remaining. <laughs> uh, about $194 million. Uh, compared to our earlier study, it's about a 32% uh, increase. Um, so, from a rural economic development perspective, $194 million is a, is a pretty good amount of, of economic impact. The labor income spinning off of that is uh, almost $84 million. Um, we, we took a micro focus too, and we looked at the incomes coming off of the properties of the employees that they, that they hire, and what those salaries are compared to the medians in the counties. 
and, and they're doing pretty well. So it's, we're, we're talking about you know, jobs, but also very good jobs. We've got them in a charitable giving because that's a pretty important component as well. We want to make sure that the landowners are contributing back to the communities. And again, we saw pretty significant increases in that as well. In terms of the job outlook, uh, about 1,725 jobs that were directly or indirectly tied to the properties. About 1,000 of them were direct jobs. So what's interesting is like in, in Thomas County, which is the, the biggest county from an economic uh, development perspective in terms of the quail properties, you know, they had, they had one or two really large industries in the community. Caterpillar was one. Caterpillar closed down and relocated elsewhere. Southwestern State Hospital was the second big one. Closed down and moved elsewhere. But Thomas County has almost 700 jobs tied up in these quail hunting properties. Those are not going to quit, close down and go elsewhere. So while it's not like you got, you're bringing in a business with 150 jobs, you're bringing in a whole bunch of small businesses with 10 or 15 jobs. Um, fascinating statistic here. Uh, we talked to the airport directors, and if you look at all of the airport traffic coming into Thomasville Regional Airport between November through February, November 17 through February 2018, 95% of that traffic is related to quail hunting in Thomasville. Uh, the day we did a photo shoot there, we wanted to get a picture of the airport director in front of a jet. We had to move 10 small jets to get a picture of him with one jet just in the, in the, in the, in the camera angle. So it's, it's pretty crazy stuff. Here's how this breaks down. I know y'all are interested in Leon County, and we'll, we'll jump to there in a second. Uh, Thomas County is just the big winner just because of, from an acreage perspective, about $92 million in economic impact, uh, up significantly from 2013. But Leon County did really well as well, $42 million of impact directly tied to the hunting properties, almost 100% increase over uh, five years earlier, and I can kind of get into the reason why in the three minutes or so I have left, right? Uh, um, uh, we'll pass by this just for lack of time. So uh, Leon County here, $42 million. The, the big reason why is in this iteration of the study, we were able to track the flow of money between properties in the Red Hills region. So if your property is located in Thomas County, we didn't assume you spent all your money in Thomas County. We actually asked, where are, where are you spending your budget? And they were telling me, you know, 25% in Leon, 25% in Thomas, et cetera, et cetera. And virtually every property identified the flow of dollars from where they're located to where they're actually spending the money. So that was the biggest increase we found was that a lot of non-Leon County properties were spending money in Leon County. There were things they couldn't get in Thomas County or they couldn't get in Jefferson, but they could get here uh, in Leon County. The other thing we're seeing is we have a lot of landowners who are, they're well off, but they're selling their properties to some extent to other people coming in and they're even more well off and they're spending a lot of dollars improving properties. And we're seeing that, especially in Thomas, but also in, uh, uh, in Leon County. This is a really easy presentation for me to give in Thomas County and talking to their commission, right? Basically my whole presentation is, here's how much you're making, don't screw it up, thank you very much, okay? Um, it's, Thomas County does very well. They cater sort of to that, uh, to that audience, and it's really paying uh, great dividends for them. Um, like I said, sort of an amazing statistic here, 95% of, uh, of the air traffic is related to quail hunting up there. But from a Leon County perspective, again, what we're seeing is more and more of the properties, regardless of where they're located, are spending some portion of their budget here in Leon County. Now, I'm doing the same study in the Albany hunting belts right now, and this is the first time we've been able to sort of track the flow of dollars up there as well. And I think what we're going to see is a lot of, a lot of their budgets are going to be spent, even though they're located in, in the Albany area, they're going to be spending a lot of money in Thomas County and Leon County as well. So it's going to be kind of interesting. These, the numbers we see for Leon are just sort of the, the low end of the spectrum, those dollars are going to, are going to rise. Um, Historically, we kind of think about these kind of land uses as they're just in a holding pattern, waiting for, you know, big bucks and waiting for the next highest and best use. But in a lot of our rural areas, this is a really good highest and best use. This is the highest and best use that's protecting the, the natural landscape. It's protecting community character and it's actually providing some pretty good economic impact as well. So a lot of times I kind of hear about the, some of the nebulous topics of sustainability. But in my mind, when I'm, thinking, when I'm thinking about sustainability, I'm thinking about protecting the natural resources of the area, which we've, we've done in space in the Red Hills region. We've, we've got a, tall timbers as 145,000 acres under reason right now. So we've done a good job on, on the, uh, the ecological aspect, 
we're doing a pretty good job on the economic aspect and of course the protection of community character as well. So for me, these are all really good reasons to support conservation of these rural areas. Did I, did I hit the time, Steve? Yeah, you're good. All right, awesome. <laughs> That's normally uh, a half hour presentation in 10 minutes. Uh, sorry for so brief. Uh, I do have uh, copies of the study, and if anybody wants to have one, uh, you're, you're welcome to do so. Are they online too? They are online as well. Yes. But I've got the uh, hard copies that are available for anybody who'd like one. Thank you, Neil. Um, and great job condensing a half hour presentation into uh, 10, 12 minutes. Our next panelist is Scott Brockmeyer. Uh, Scott has been employed with Leon County Development Support and Environmental Services, our county's growth management department, uh, for over 15 years and has worked in the field of growth management and code compliance for over 20 years. He does not look like he has that much experience, I'll be honest. <laughs> he has been a resident of Leon County for over 20 years and has a bachelor's degree from Florida State University College of Business uh, in Marketing. He is a certified public manager via the FSU Center for Public Management. With that, I uh, invite Scott up to the podium. Everybody. Good evening. Uh, Scott Brockmeyer. Uh, thanks for coming out. Um, I want to share with you a little bit of information about the... Hang on, this isn't my presentation here. Something didn't pop up. <coughs> Scott, can you talk about the economic impact of Red Hills Grelling property? <laughs> <laughs> Probably got enough time. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'd like to make it a little bit quick uh, for you, but uh, they asked me to come out and talk a little bit about mostly agritourism and the county's rural zoning district, which uh, we deal with on a, on a daily basis. The agritourism, not so much. That's more something that's uh, provided through the Department of Community um, Agriculture and, and um, Consumer Services, I'm sorry, DACS. So, uh, I'll give you a quick overview. So we'll talk about the Rural Zoning District, uh, Florida's Right to Farm Act, as well as the Agritourism Bill. Uh, also, I uh, said so be remiss if I didn't come down to Woodville and talk about the uh, 219 provisions in our Rural Zoning District, as well as something that's uh, rel relatively new, accessory dwelling units, which uh, have been uh, uh, pretty popular as well. So uh, looking at the Rural Zoning District, uh, it, was, it was pretty much re rebirthed, if you will, um, 2016. Uh, there were some amendments to focus back, not so much on the 70s and what we wanted to do with rural then, but what we wanted to do uh, today and protect and promote uh, agriculture, uh, preserve our scenic vistas, our rural areas, and uh, their function. Uh, also curtail sprawl, which is an important component of the comp plan. Uh, so that was uh, all revisited uh, in 2016. Uh, Keep it rural was uh, critical in getting that all uh, revamped. And uh, we got a much better working rural zoning district today than we've ever had. Uh, first and foremost, the allowable uses in, in rural zoning district, of course, agriculture, silviculture, those types of things, we want to promote those, we want to protect them uh, from development and sprawl. Uh, also, community services, those are still allowed, uh, as is very low uh, residential, very low density residential development. That wasn't changed with regard to the density. Uh, commercial uses, that was probably the largest overhaul in the rural zoning district. Uh, I think what prompted all the changes was a proposed gas station out of a Crump Road. It was uh, very controversial. I think a lot of people were surprised that something like that would even be allowed in the rural area. Uh, you think gas stations, you think of suburbia. Uh, definitely not something we wanted out in rural. So that was the primary focus was to get back to what commercial uses would we allow in rural and which one we just wanted to wipe, wipe from the slate. So a little bit, it was like taking an extra sketch board, just shaping it up and saying, all right, what do we want to put in here and what should be allowed? Um, 
So here are some of the standards for rural. Um, the allowable density, as I mentioned, is one per 10. That hasn't changed since the comp plan was adopted in 1990. Um, we do allow that family air policy 209. I'll get into that a little bit. That is an exception from that. So minimum lot size, if you wanted to come in and create a lot today, is 10 acres. So you have to have 20 acres to split uh, land in rural. If you've got less than that, it probably happened before the comp plan or maybe use the family air policy 219. Uh, local amendments to the rural zoning district, as I mentioned in 2016, those were the, uh, the big uh, substantive changes that we made. And what it does is uh, it helps protect uh, those farms from uh, closure. And what I mean, uh, as Neil mentioned earlier, is highest and best use. People are always looking for highest and best use. You got suburban subdivisions that are sprawling out to the rural area. Before you know the developers are knocking on the door of the farmer who's maybe having a tough time making ends meet from year to year and all of a sudden it becomes attractive to say well you know i might sell this piece of land cash out go ahead and retire but what that does is it takes off uh, it takes a big chunk of land it takes a farm off the map and, and once that's developed as a subdivision uh, you don't get that back uh, so we're trying to prevent the fragmentation of those areas we're trying to protect these farmers we want to help them where we can uh, and that sort of leads into um, the, next, the next slide. Oh, and also um, the, the Right to Farm Act, uh, that was uh, implemented in 1979. Uh, what it was intended to do is, is protect these farms from these suburban subdivisions, the sprawl that was going out from nuisance claims. That was a big problem, I guess they saw in the late 70s and decided they were gonna put together some regulation to help protect those farms. Meaning uh, they can't say, well, this farm is creating a nuisance, it's affecting my property values, this, that, and the other. It's like, well, the farm was there first, you came to the nuisance, and there's some historic landmark uh, zoning cases in that regard. So that was important for them to get that piece of legislation on the book in the late 70s. Um, moving on, uh, agricultural classification. If you do have agricultural property, it's important you talk to the property appraisers. Uh, to make sure you're getting your exemption. That's a big part of protecting agricultural land in our rural areas. You need to get that, uh, that, that exemption, that classification, I should say. Uh, there's some contact information on there. Uh, first and foremost, you'll be surprised, you, you gotta be in the rules, or in one of these zoning districts that allow ag. Uh, I've had people ask with lots in subdivisions um, for residential if they can get a agricultural classification. Quite simply, the answer is no. <laughs> um, there are minimum acreages that the property appraisal office uh, does recommend that may require for certain types of activities, whether it be crops, timber, or pasture. And uh, only the areas of the property that's being used for the farming activity or civil culture activity is where they can apply under statute uh, that exemption or that classification. So uh, most farms do have a family homestead on there. Uh, so there's usually a plan that they'll have and they'll have that separate from the overall classification and that land, of course, and if you live in there, you get the homestead exemption, but uh, that's some of the things that they look at um, when you're filing your paperwork for the classification. Uh, unfortunately, sorry, Daniel hunting or um, hunting leases don't qualify for that exemption. Um, and non-residential buildings used in farming activities are exempt from building permits. That's a big thing. That's something we hear about. Thank you. <laughs> The sign before. That's something that a lot of people will come into our office and say, hey, this is a farm building. Is it, is it classified as ag? It's got to be classified as ag for you to be exempt from that uh, building permit requirement under Florida statute. So it's important for you to get that agricultural classification if you qualify, not only to reduce your taxes, but reap some of these other benefits that are out there in the bill. Here's the definition of agritourism. This was great because it came back in 20. 13 and created a bill for agritourism. What's another way we can help protect, preserve our farms uh, in these areas and also give them a boost? Uh, farms are really becoming quite endangered. I don't have the statistics on that, I'm sorry, but uh, with regard to farming, you know they're, they're facing threats not only with the uncertainty of the economy, the climate change and things like that is putting a lot of pressure on farmers these days. Uh, not only that, it's competition from, from some of the big suppliers as well. So we want to Try and find ways to uh, promote what they're doing, but also help them give them a boost. And uh, this agritourism bill is probably the best thing they did to help farms in the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years. So there's the definition for agritourism. To be protected under this statute, you have to um, um, 
you have to have uh, best practices under that statute that you have to meet. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. So what does agritourism allow? It allows events and activities on farms with the intent to generate additional income, promote the farming. So uh, in 2016, the reason why there was two um, um, different dates up there is they came back in 16 to clarify. Uh, in 13, they said local government cannot pass any regulations uh, to prohibit or restrict uh, agritourism activities on a working farm. Uh, there was some uh, unclarity with that in uh, South Florida, on one of the farms down there. So the legislature brought back uh, an item in 2016 and it passed to basically say local government hands off. <laughs> uh, you can have ceremonies, wedding ceremonies, any of those types of things to help offset the cost and impacts of running a farm to your budget. And uh, I think the best one I can think of is um, that I've been to lately is uh, Phipps out there off of Meridian Road. I was out there just last November, a friend got married, and I got to see this in action because there was a pole barn that she uses as part of the stable. Uh, obviously they do dressage or something under there when it's raining, but um, that was where they had the wedding. It was a great venue. It was very, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Peaceful. It, it was very peaceful, thank you. It was very rustic too. It felt like you were actually on the farm and could have been there forever. Uh, this is an important part of the legislation here, the second bullet point. Uh, we had somebody trying to do this on the other side of town and that they were trying to build a restaurant on what they call the farm, uh, but that's not really what the statute allows. You can't build a structure specifically to house activities or events. You can use existing structures, you can build farm buildings, uh, and when those farm buildings are in use, of course, you can use those. Um, there's the local government you can adopt or enforce additional regulations. Uh, local government still can regulate offsite impacts with regards to farms, but as long as they're following those uh, best management practices, they should be protected. Uh, family Air 219, I'll go through this real quick because I got two minutes. I apologize for dragging along. Uh, if you're in the rural area, you saw that one for 10, and if you're one of the people we've talked to in the office, your heart probably would have stopped a little bit and you had to uh, add additional dwelling in it or uh, figure out if you could subdivide a piece of property. If it's for a family member that qualifies under that statute because they've defined family member, uh, you can potentially apply the Family Air 219. The catch is the property has to be in the same configuration since it was in February 1, 1990. The hardship provision is that you're doing it for a family member that's supposed to be homesteading on the property uh, and it's not subject to the density limits in the comprehensive plan. Uh, one per ten doesn't apply as long as you have a half acre buildable, sometimes a little more, uh, to meet the requirements. Uh, the other big uh, component is the uh, property cannot be transferred to anybody outside of the family for a period of two years. Uh, when that legislation was being proposed, it was 10 years, it dropped to five, and then the night of the board meeting actually went down to two. But uh, that, that was an important component as it was making its rounds through the, uh, the various uh, committees that uh, they wanted to make sure that people could get the money out of the lot or if they could uh, transfer it uh, to somebody else, family member or otherwise. Here are the uh, eligibility requirements. I won't go through all of them. Half acre lot I mentioned, same configuration. There's the folks that qualify under the air provisions. And uh, you actually can later on divide the property uh, for successive generations. So if I have a, a five acre lot and I cut out two acres for my daughter, uh, eventually one day she should be able to cut out an acre for her daughter. Uh, again, you gotta go through the same process she went through originally, but the ability to do that is there. And uh, last but not least, accessory dwelling units. Uh, this is relatively new in the grand scheme of things, but uh, with regard to accessory dwelling units, uh, we do allow them attached or detached uh, on a property that has an existing single family home. Uh, there's a limit of 800 square feet or less. This is great if you need to take care of mom or dad. You know, pesky density regulations get in the way. This gives you the ability to do that. Uh, the only thing you need to file with us is a land use compliance certificate, or RCC as we call it. $45, you come with your permit, we actually credit the $45 back to you. That's our way of saying thank you for checking with us before you go out and start building plans for, uh, making up plans for your home. So uh, I think that's the last slide, and that's all I have. And uh, I guess like Neil said, at the end, I guess there'll be questions. We'll be glad to answer them for you. And again, thanks for coming out.
Thank you, Scott. Uh, our next panelist is Del Suggs. Uh, you may know Del Suggs as the nationally recognized singer, songwriter, and recording artist. If you don't, I highly recommend you pull up Spotify and look him up and start listening to Living Deliberately <laughs> yeah. and Old Blue Ford, personal favorites. Uh, but he's also been a dedicate, dedicated community volunteer since the 1980s, uh, along with his service to the Tallahassee Museum, the Tallahassee Winter Festival, and many other local and national organizations. Dell has been president of the Big Bend Scenic Byway for the past 10 years. Uh, the byway is a work in progress. Uh, although you may be surprised it was been accomplished so far, and Dell uh, will explain what that is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Artie. Well, um, make sure you set the timer because I can talk about this stuff for hours. Um, the, the Big Bend Scenic Byway is a real passion for me. I know a lot of you have probably seen the signs, you have no idea what it is. You see it every, everywhere you, when you drive along. So I'm going to give you kind of basically what our concept of what this is. There are classic American drives all around the country. The Blue Ridge Parkway, Route 66, Pacific Coast Highway, or something you'll think of. We want to see the Big Bend City Byway thought of in the same category as these other drives. We think it's, it's, it's worthy and, you know, we tend to take it for granted. We drive down Coastal 98, and, and you know, and there's the, there's the, the Appalachian Bay, and we just kind of drive on. We don't even think anything about it. I bring friends and drive this with uh, friends from out of town, and they are stunned at how beautiful it is. We tend to take it for granted when, because we live here. And so this is one of the things we wanted to point out with this. Give you a quick, quick uh, the, the layout of this. You'll see uh, the Big Bend City Bible essentially starts in Apalachicola, runs along the coast to Newport, although it does also go down to St. Mark's. Um, comes up uh, to Tallahassee, it comes up um, the blocks have cut off and then Spring Hill Road up, takes Capitol Circle around, uh, around the airport, then out Highway 20, uh, down Smith Creek Road, down through Sop Choppy, and then back down to Apalachicola. We have one little spur over here, the forest, we call it Forest Trail West. Uh, I'll mention it was originally intended as one big loop going actually through Liberty County and Bristol. And when the, uh, the founders first began working on this in 2002, the people in Liberty County were so upset about it, they actually contacted their congressman and said, do not make us join this. And we said, if you don't want us, we don't want you either. You know? so, that, so that's why it's become this kind of an uh, interesting loop. They have since contacted us and asked if they could join, but it's too late now um, in the process. So it's interesting how this stuff all comes about. We want to include that because as you can see here in the Forest Trail West, um, this is one of the largest collections of, of carnivorous plants on the planet right through here. And so this is a very exciting uh, piece of piece of the body to, to drive. Yeah. All right, so let me get back and kind of give you some of the lowdown on, on what, what this is. Big Bend Scenic Byway is the longest scenic byway in the state of Florida. It's 220 miles long. You've probably heard of other scenic byways that exist in the state, Scenic 30A, you see bumper stickers, or Scenic A1A, um, Indian River uh, Scenic Byway, they're all over the state. They average about 12 miles. Ours is 220 miles. It goes through three counties. You can see here the list of all the different agencies that we touch on. To me, it's a beautiful example of cooperation between these groups. Uh, you can also see um, it's also a struggle to deal with all of these groups, as you might well imagine. Uh, we first got a major grant to work on this, and we were going to, uh, to talk to, to uh, Commissioner Jane Sauls about it. And I was so excited because we had this, this funding, we were going to be able to make this thing happen. And I was talking to her, uh, her, her aide before I went in, and I said, I'm so thrilled because this means that Leon County can work with Wakulla County, Franklin County. We're all gonna, you know, I was singing Kumbaya. We're all going to be working together. And she just looked at me and said, Dell, I'll pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I've learned now what she meant by this. There's a lot of different government agencies to be involved with here. Real quick history. This is totally a grassroots effort. This was started by citizens in the three counties. Didn't come from the top, didn't come from the state, didn't come from DOT. Uh, Wakulla County jumped on first in April of, of, of 2002. Franklin County followed a few months later, and then Leon County was kind of late to the party there. Um, we got our, our actual statewide designation in 2007, which was a big deal. And in 2009, we were actually named a National Scenic Byway. This is a very big deal. One reason it's a big deal is because every single scenic byway in the country has to be judged as unique. So when you actually make your pitch, up for that, you have to explain exactly why your byway is totally unique to every other byway in the country. So that's, that's one of the challenges we face to get all this together. The byway is actually run by a board called, we call the, uh, the, the BMA, the Byway Management Agency. Um, 
It includes all the, all the federal land agencies, uh, federal and state agencies, local businesses, state, county, and city governments, educational institutions, civic groups, uh, the tourist development councils, and all three uh, counties, all are involved with this. So we have institutional memberships, not individual members. So each of these institutions is represented there. Um, real quickly, how we meet, we meet quarterly. Uh, we, meet, we go from county to county, we meet. We have no paid staff. It's totally volunteer, totally volunteer. We have no office space. So it's a, it's a challenge doing this entirely with volunteers, but we've been very successful uh, so far with, with, with everything that we've done. So this is essentially the bioage purpose, and this is really near and dear to my heart. The first thing is that this is an economic engine. We see the byway as an engine that really fuels the entire eco-economy, uh, the, the tourism economy uh, through this entire area. We believe that people will come here from all over the world to drive this byway and look at these vistas and things and things here. So that's a, that's a major thing there. And the other one that's near and dear to my heart is this. Um, although we have no um, authority of any sort, we hope that this will help limit the, the, um, uh, any, any environmental and historical damage out there because we want to preserve these vistas so that people can see and the historical sites for people to visit. We need to save what makes us unique. So that's one of the beautiful things about the byway. We have no legal authority to do any of this, although I will tell you one thing I think you'll, I think you'll agree is a good thing. Uh, when we did receive our, our national designation, we were told that what they did was it, it capped the number of billboards that can be put up. So from that point on, no more new billboards can be licensed along these roads. So I, that's, that's a good move right there. I don't think anybody wants to see more billboards, <laughs> unless you sell billboards. <laughs> so that, 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 that's an exciting thing there. Well, the first thing you have to do when you become a byway is develop what they call a way showing the interpretive plan. Why is your byway important? And here, how are you going to get people around? So this is our tagline right here. Explore undiscovered North Florida. The Big Bend City Byway will transport you to a different time and place through its wildlife, woods, waterways, and way of life. This is designed to appeal to people that didn't come here to see Disney World. And they didn't come here just to go to the beach. They want to see what else is out there in the, in the state. And, uh, so this is what we tag us on to. Um, each byway has to tell a story, and so this is our story. We have three topics, wildlife and woods, water and waterways, and way of life. We've done some, um, some PSAs that, that have had very little play, but I'm going to share these with you right now, because this will kind of show, give you an example of how we've addressed uh, each of these topics. The Big Bend Scenic Byway will transport you to a different time and place through its wildlife, waterways, woods, and way of life. From fire forests filled with wildlife to oyster houses for the hungry traveler, the Big Bend Scenic Byway offers something for every visitor. Historic towns, historic waterways, and nature's own history just waiting for you. North Florida's Big Bend Scenic Byway. Explore the undiscovered. The Big Bend Scenic Byway will transport you to a different time and place through its wildlife, waterways, woods, and way of life. With nearly a million acres of public lands, the 220 miles of the Big Bend Scenic Byway offers diverse habitats and diverse wildlife, too. Whether you're a hiker, cyclist, wildlife viewer, or motorist, expect the unexpected. Seasonal wildflowers will leave you breathless as you hope your stay will never end. North Florida's Big Bend Scenic Byway. Explore the undiscovered. The Big Bend Scenic Byway will transport you to a different time and place through its wildlife, waterways, woods, and way of life. Saltwater vistas greet your eyes and river systems define the traditional life of the area. The Big Bend Scenic Byway offers an abundance of coastlines, brackish streams, and freshwater springs, with views of natural perfection like nowhere else. Come visit us, get wet, or just get on board. North Florida's Big Bend Scenic Byway. Explore the undiscovered. Okay, there's one more. The Big Bend Scenic Byway will transport you to a different time and place through its wildlife, waterways, woods, and way of life. In some special places, life just keeps on getting better. The Big Bend Scenic Byway is dotted with small towns that always have been and still are all about people. From oystering and fishing to local history undisturbed, the Big Bend Scenic Byway offers a diverse and unmatched sense of place every day. North Florida's Big Bend Scenic Byway. Explore the undiscovered. 
So you can see we've got a lot to be proud of, a lot to, a lot to sell to, to people, travelers who want to come and see this stuff. We, we, again, because we, we're here and we see it all the time, we take it for granted. But there's an awful lot here. There's an awful lot here. So the first thing we had to do then is create um, our, our, our way showing um, program and our interpretive plan. Way showing is how you get around. An interpretive plan is what's actually out there. So we first thing we did was create our publications. I hope you, a lot of you got a copy of the tear off maps when you came in. Really proud of those. There's also a thing called the, the, the uh, guide that we've been seeing by me. This is a beautiful, beautiful uh, publication. You can, get, you can pick up one of those. There are actually two different maps. Um, one is, is the one we've used for several years, which actually covers the, the Cocoa Trail and the, and the Forest Trail. Another new one I'm really, really excited about, um, and I'll touch on it real briefly, is we actually did an entire survey of the byway uh, three years ago about accessibility. Our goal is to be the first universally accessible byway in the country. So we have actually served out our entire byway. You can look at this, you can see exactly what's accessible, what's not. We do this because, uh, for two reasons. First of all, it's the right thing to do. And second of all, we do it because we know that travelers cater to the needs of, of, of a disabled person if there's someone with them. And so by knowing exactly where things are wheelchair accessible, where you can get beach chairs and roll people down to the water on the beach up in a chair, uh, where there's where there are braille menus, uh, makes a big difference. So that's, that's one of the reasons we did this. So we got these all done. This is a beautiful thing. Now the next step is actually the physical structure. If you've driven the Blue Ridge Parkway, you know there's a pull-offs, there are exhibits, there are things you can stop and visit. So this is what we have worked on. We actually created a, <clears throat> a plan in 2010, which um, is now used as the national model. We got grant funding for that in 2011, which we received in 2012 to actually create all of these. I'm gonna run through these real quickly. You've probably seen our tertiary signs. They're the first things out there now. You see these small signs, they're attached to poles with other signs. Oh, this is called glomming, so you have fewer poles. But we, uh, those, those are already up and in place. Um, the next thing that we'll be going to be constructing are our, our primary portals. These will be the areas where you'll pull off and learn about the byway, and there's eight of these in total across the entire byway. Essentially, wherever you enter the byway from, an, from an, another outside road, there will be a portal to welcome you that you can pull over and learn about the byway. Um, there's one at either end of the byway along the coast. There's one coming in from the north, um, salt choppy. In addition to that, we also have um, Secondary portals, smaller portals that would be kind of located along the way in smaller towns, places like um, Sop Chopping will actually have a secondary portal. St. George Island will actually have a secondary portal. Uh, there's going to be a secondary portal in downtown Caraville. So that all ties them together. And then finally, our wayside exhibits. If you've ever traveled much, and you can pull over these wayside exhibits and kind of see what all is there. It's a beautiful thing to be able to stop and learn about the vistas that are around you and what all is there. This is a total package. This is what, it, what the whole thing is. Um, the most exciting thing about all of this is it's fully funded. We received a grant in 2012 of $800,000 uh, from the federal government, one of the last scenic, National Scenic Byway grants uh, to, 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 uh, to, to make this happen. Um, the trouble is we've been, we've been pushing this rope uphill for a long time. Um, we received the grants. It has to be done actually by uh, what's called a lab certified agency. Leon County Public Works has taken it on. Uh, and we are hopeful in the next few months it's actually going to go to RFP and you'll start to see some of the some of the, the of this actually taking place and they have because we can't really do much with it until we actually have the exhibits in place that people can see. Thank you so much. like hearing what's going on with the Big Ben saying by the way. Um, our next panelist is Forrest Watson. Uh, he recently retired from Florida, the state of Florida after 33 and a half years of service. Quite impressive. Also, you don't look like that's possible. Uh, the last 18 years being with the Florida Forest Service, he originally moved to Leon County in 1984 to attend graduate school at Florida State University. He, originally, he was originally appointed to the Canopy Road Citizens Committee in uh, 2015 uh, by the city and currently serves as the chairman of that committee. Uh, with that, welcome Forrest. Thank you, thank you. I may get you to, one of the things I did when I retired is I forgot how to use PowerPoint. <laughs> so I might get you to actually yeah, no. do that with it. Um, note to self, never follow Dale Suggs in a speech. Um, 
it, it's a pleasure to be here. Normally, uh, we would have the person who works with the city and the county, Mindy. She's our urban forester. She does a great job with us. It's like herding cats. But she's out of town this week, so she asked if I would come to talk to y'all. So I'm glad to be here. But I do have a few notes. And so you kind of got the B team, and I'm sorry about that. But anyway, um, let's talk about canopy roads. You know, one of my things that I like about it is history and things like that. And, 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 and hitting on what Dale talked about is uh, unknown resources. Why do we have canopy roads? Why did Tallahassee have canopy roads? The Indian trails, the, the, the Spanish used them and the early settlers. Why, you know, it, by 1900, most of our longleaf pines were, were clear cut over. They became the mass for tall ships. You know, a lot of our live oaks were cut down, become the hulls of ships. But why do the canopy roads exist? The reason is, a lot of people don't forget about, is there was no air conditioning. People didn't have cars with air conditioning. They were in carts or they were walking. And the, they, the, the canopies would pr provide shade. Because in Florida, I can tell you in August, June, July, anyone who lives here in Florida and who knows that the shade is a very good benefit to have. So if you, you're, you're shaded, your animal's shaded, they can go farther without water, all those benefits. So that's really something about canopy roads that a lot of people forget that they've been here they served a very important purpose to us and now they can even serve another important purpose is a reason for people could come to Tallahassee among all the other numerous things is to enjoy our canopy roads and uh, actually go down to the, the very last slide because what one of the big things that happened with us is uh, with the canopy roads committee is the main thing we were doing was we were basically approving plans that involved the canopy roads. And if you don't know what the canopy road protection zone is, it's this area like 50 feet on each side of, of a high of a canopy roads is the canopy road protection zone. And a lot of that area is not even owned by the public, I mean, by the public, it's in private hands. So anyway, uh, the reason I wanted to go back to that, because that's probably the most important, no, this one right here, yeah. That's probably the most important slide, believe it or not, because that can give you, if you go to and get those sites, you get a wealth of knowledge, including our canopy road protection plan, which recently was approved by both the county commission and the city commission, and they didn't even have to debate it a lot because we had a lot of workshop, a few workshops on it. We got a lot of public input, and we like to think they were real happy with what we were proposing to do for our canopy roads. Um, going back, Go back now to the beginning, to the second slide. Thank you for, for this. Um, there, and, uh, there's canopy roads, there's 78 miles of canopy roads in Leon <laughs> County. The original ones was Old Bainbridge, North Meridian, <laughs> Centerville, Mississippi, Old St. Augustine. Those were, those were started, uh, designated in 1972, and then in, uh, in 2007, Moxie Gap Road, Sunny Hill Road, and Pigs Hawk Church Road was uh, added to it. In fact, you know, it's always been a great learning experience being on this committee. And I'll tell you, because you just don't realize the things where you are as a committee or as far as progressing and protecting canopy roads. Like one of the things that's come up is, well, if you have an area that you would like to designate a canopy ro road, how do you go about the application process? And everyone thought, that's a great question. And now we're beginning to develop a, a potential application process that would involve a lot of public input. You just can't go out and designate something as a canopy roads. But it's just all those kind of things as a committee we're trying to do and get together and move forward. So anyway, we, we've got these canopy roads areas and stuff. And um, one of the things we do is when we, we got our canopy roads protection plan approved, management plan, is one of the big things about that was, is, is how can we use the canopy roads to increase tourism and things like that? No, but, you know, we don't want to love our resource to death. So you've got to draw that, you know, how do you protect it? How do you make sure it's here for future generations? But how do you make sure it's enjoyed by the people today? So that's where we're trying to go with what we're trying to do with our management plan. 
And um, we basically did it, you know, you want to have goals, you want to have objectives, you want to have strategies for accomplishing these objectives. And um, our first, yeah, there it is, of per to perpetuate the Canopy Roads experience. That's been, I, uh, that's nothing new. It's been around for a while. We just borrowed from that. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel on everything. So our, our first goal that we, we came about was we wanted to educate, go, educate and engage the community on the Canopy Roads experience. Basically, we wanted to make sure that the management of our Canopy Roads is community driven. You can, you know, go on. Yeah, right there. Because it, it's amazing to us People can buy a house and their property can be right next to a canopy roads or it, part of it's in the canopy roads protection zone and they don't even know it because it's not required for a realtor to provide any kind of information to a person. So, I mean, it's available if you, if you were smart enough to, before you start doing crazy things and major landscaping to, to Google, but as far as just requiring realtors or asking realtors to provide information to to future buyers or prospective buyers about that, it's not currently being done. So that's one of the things we want to do is, that's just one strategy about educating and engaging the community in the whole experience. You know, get out there and enjoy them. Here's what they are. Our second goal is uh, we want to get involved with the guide the development policies that protect, enhance, and expand the Canopy Roads experience. You know, we're we're just a can we're just a citizens committee. We're all volunteers. We're not we're not paid or anything like that. And we, we just recommend, we look at projects that come in and we react to them and we recommend how we think they would have, have the least amount of impact on the canopy roads. We see a lot of driveway applications. We see applications for uh, fixing sewers and things like that. But um, one of the things we want to do is make sure that we're, we're at the table when, when discussions are, are happening. The, the third, third goal we want to do is uh, we basically want to make sure we preserve and enhance intrinsic resources. You know, the trees, the trees don't live forever. A lot, I've always heard a live oak tree lives about 300 years. It's first 100 years, it's getting mature. Second 100 years, it's enjoying life. And the third 100 years, it's declining. And, and that's what we got to do. If you, if you look at the canopy roads, there's a lot of mature trees. We got to make sure these trees are not going to live forever, that we lose them in storage. We just got to make sure there's going to be trees there to be there when the, the, the older ones die or things happen to them. And our fourth goal is, we, is to provide and support safe non-motorized access and connectivity while preserving the integrity of the Canopy Roads experience. So we're, we're basically trying to look at ways that we can link to existing trails and things like that and making them more accessible to the public. We're working at doing a few little bike trails inside the zones and things like that. But like I said, it's also going to involve, you know, working some with the, uh, the private citizens because a lot of the canopy roads is in private citizens' hands and, and things like that. But uh, we're, we're real excited. We, we think there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, we want to make sure they stay healthy. You know, if you notice, there's a lot of uh, invasive species within the canopy roads protection zones. We're trying to make sure that those can get cleaned up, get rid of some of the vines that are really attacking them, things like that. Um, so, so that's basically what we're doing. I, I'm real excited. Uh, when I came on board, it, I felt like we were doing, we were more reactionary, and that we had our, our previous uh, chairman and uh, I, we were talking, we were like, we need to be more proactive. If you read what the bylaws say, that's what we're supposed to be doing. So we've tried to do that. And this is kind of, we have a five-year action plan and talks about our various strategies and things like that. And I don't want to go bore you with all that. But anyway, we're moving in the right direction. And I think, you know, Leon County's moving in the right direction. I think there's a lot of great things, historical, natural resources that besides football that Tallahassee and Leon County can offer. So appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Forrest, and thank you for your service to the uh, uh, Campy Road Citizens Committee as well. 
Uh, last but certainly not least, our uh, final speaker tonight is Jeanette Duncan. Uh, Jeanette Duncan joined the Tallahassee Leon County Planning Department uh, last year as a planner within the Design Works Urban Div uh, Design Division. She brings eight years of experience in comprehensive planning, code enforcement, and development management from the city of Dunedin and Trask Deo, uh, a municipal law firm. Uh, a West Palm Beach native, Jeanette studied residential sciences and urban and regional planning at Florida State University. Her drive for community planning begins as a lifelong sportsman and with a desire to preserve Florida's environment for future generations. That, by Jeanette. Thank you all for being here. I have to say I am so honored to be here tonight. I left Tallahassee after my time at Florida State. I can remember driving down 98 in my Jeep trailer loaded full of all my stuff, thinking to myself, why am I leaving? Why, why am I leaving this place that I love? But nonetheless, I went and I came back, and I'm so glad to be here. This rural community that we have around the core of Tallahassee is why I'm here. So I'm grateful to be here and I'm really, really grateful to talk to you about it tonight. Um, as I already mentioned, I'm part of the Design Works Division in the Planning Department. We have a really unique asset within our division, uh, uh, within our department. Um, our division does a lot of site plan assistance for our local community, whether it's uh, individual owners or developers. Uh, we get to deal with a lot of really cool projects. Um, the Gaines Street design guidelines, we've worked on those. Um, we've done a lot of really cool stuff. I, I get to be in charge of wayfinding system. I don't know if you've seen it downtown, the big yellow signs that point people, all of our visitors, where to go. I'm working on implementing that. We're also looking at possibly adopting some more of a regional scale, getting it in the ground in the county. Um, so we get to be involved in a lot of really cool projects, and I'm very grateful to be here. So we're talking today about placemaking. Does anybody know what placemaking is? That's okay, that's okay. <laughs> the way I like to see it, and the way I like to describe it, kind of is a big picture thing. Um, how do you know when you're in the South? Sweet tea? Mosquitoes? Magnolias? Magnolias? Humidity? Maybe the twang? Yeah, all these things, they all tell you that you're in place. Everything around you tells you you're in a place. The unique things that you experience, your senses, tell you you're in a place. You might be in a space and not in a place if nothing of that is hitting any of your senses. Design Works has had the opportunity, and our planning department has had an opportunity to work with a lot of different communities in developing what we call placemaking plans around the county. Uh, we have a Midtown Action Plan, a Monroe Adams Quarter Action Plan, a Market Square Action Plan, French Town Place Thinking Plan, Lake Jackson Town Center at Huntington Sense of Place Initiative, and the Mississippi Rural Community Sense of Place Plan. I've been very honored to participate with the implementation of the last plan. I've met a lot of really cool citizens out in Mississippi, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a few minutes. So I just wanted to pull up this slide because I think this is a great um, opportunity to explain how we can create space. You see on the left-hand side, we've got Cascades Trail coming through here. There's one of our wayfinding signs. Um, but on the right here, we've got a private business, and we've incorporated art into this place. And that's what makes it so unique. This image was probably, some of you have seen, um, a result of post-Hurricane Michael, we had some of our groups with our uh, group formed within our community to paint the mural, bring awareness to our coast, and bring awareness to the fact that, hey, look, we're resilient, we're gonna come out of this, we're never forgotten, we're Florida. Um, the artist is, um, I'm just trying to remember, Alex Workman and Jesse Taylor. And if you were to go and, and pull up that hashtag, I guarantee you'd probably see hundreds of pictures of people stopping in front of this mural at this place and experiencing it together. So you can probably Google placemaking and come up with about a dozen different definitions. So I decided to make my own, <laughs> and I think it's pretty good. But the way that I would define it, it's the way a community can incorporate art and culture into its environment to create places that people want to be and places that people want to connect together. 
And I think we have a lot of opportunity to do that here. But you know what? It's not just about making places. It's about connecting people. Um, this is an image from our Midtown Merchants Association gathering at uh, the Fifth and Thomas, Thomasville um, improvements that were made along that street. Um, it's about creating spaces for people. Placemaking can take so many different forms. When you think about it, I'm gonna, I mentioned before, um, you gotta hit all your senses. We need places for music. This is a shot of our railroad square, just a couple of artists playing music, hitting the senses, hitting the sound. You know, we have an auditory memory. When you listen to the radio and you hear a song, it takes you back to the place in time. You probably remember where you were when you heard it, or maybe you remember who you were with. And that's what place is all about. It's about making places for food. It's about playing on the heartstrings. You know what they say, the way to a person's heart is through their stomach. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, so by incorporating food into our places, whether it's markets, these are images from the South Side Market, creating places where we can interact together and we can share over those resources that we need and, and meals that we create together. You know, my father has this crazy uncanny ability. We can be sitting around the table talking about vacations or trips we may, may have taken years, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. And he can sit there and say, oh, I remember what I had for dinner that night. I remember what I ate. He can sit there and tell me about the room that we were in. And he just, he, he's developed this whole scene in his mind because of the place that he was, the people that he was with, and what he was doing. We need to make places for our folk life, for our culture. Um, you know, we love to travel places and we bring things back as mementos of where we've been. They remind us of a place that we've been and those memories that we've shared together. We need to make places for history. It's our job to make sure that whatever history has been created is preserved. This is the Civil Rights um, Memory Walk on Jefferson and Monroe. It's important to, to pass along to the next generation uh, all of these components of our past, and we can do that by making great places for them to visit it. This is our Mississippi working group. We have uh, 10 members, we have four of the 10 members, sitting around the table doing a rural history documentation. This is one of the coolest things that I ever had the experience and pleasure of witnessing. Um, listening cross-generational, um, cross-racial, you know, cross I grew up here, I grew up here, and I left, and I came back. Well, I'm new to the area. All the different stories that this group held, told was just incredible, and it all evolved around the place. It all evolved, revolved around Mississippi. We need to make sure that we make places where generations can cross. We don't need to be growing in silos. We need, to, we need to communicate with our older generation, and we need to bring in the new generation. We need to make places for public art. And it's not hard. This is, these are images from uh, the French Town Art Walk where community members came together and decided to take an initiative and make a public um, place for people to recognize, hey, we're here, we're, this is an arts area, we're on Georgia Street in French Town. Um, this is probably one of my most favorite images, looking down at some of the artwork that they've done. Um, and, and you know, along the street as the artwork, ha as the artwork walk happens, uh, you've got vendors selling their art on the side of the street. You're creating a community, you're creating a place, you're creating the opportunity for people to interact. Creating community. So you might be asking, okay, what does this have to do with rural economic development? Everything, absolutely everything. We just heard from these gentlemen for the past 40, 45 minutes about all the wonderful assets that we have in our community. We need to, to rediscover what they are, really to, to take them, preserve them, figure out how we can improve them, make them places that we want to be and that we want to share. You know, a lot of what they talked about was kind of on a big regional scale. It was, um, you know, the byway going all around, our large plantations, our forests, all the great farming opportunities that we have. But a whole is only as good as the sum of its parts. It's all the little places that comprise those big areas. That's what we need to focus in on. That's what placemaking is. Oops. So how do you go about doing that? You look. There are plenty of opportunities. 
as you make your drive home tonight, I encourage you to look. This is an image of the old post office in Mississippi on Moccasin Gap and, um, what is it? Uh, yes, that's the Veterans Memorial. Thank you. <laughs> um, just, just a little bit further west of that intersection, the post office was built in 1950. It didn't get electricity until 1994. It's <laughs> crazy. Um, but it is since closed within recent years, I believe. And the woman who, who was the postmaster there was Pat Harold. Uh, the, the space was just sitting vacant. So she took it upon herself to try and reactivate the space. And she opened what they call the Thrifty Post. This is a Mississippi woman's working group that put this together and reactivated the space. And as you can see, you know, it's a place for people to come together. In rural communities, you don't always have opportunities to, to see one another. You're not going to be walking down to your mailbox and necessarily see your neighbor bringing in the trash because you've got more space in between one another. So you need to find the places where you do connect and, and try and make those places a little bit better for one another so that you can have these opportunities to interact. The way you do it is you work together. This is an image from the um, um, Frenchtown uh, Butter Block that was done back in 2017. We had the Knight Foundation at the few family French Town neighborhood planning department. Everybody's pulling together to try and do a sense of place, really, to put in some light, non-permanent infrastructure, hay bales, lights, things that can be removed. And, oops, here we go. We've got some uh, makeshift medians, some lighting plants, things that can be re removed. They're just temporary in nature. But if you imagine this picture without any of that there, what is it? It's a space. You put it there, it becomes a place. Um, and I'm going to go back here for a second. Um, I, again, um, KCCI took this into, took this as a project, and I just wanted to put this up here because we've got such wonderful resources now with social media. You can hashtag anything and find anything. So I encourage you, as you look in your communities and you look to make places, go on the social media platforms, make up a hashtag, you're going to start following, people are going to start sharing it, and that's how things grow. So, what I'm going to leave you with, how do you tell the story of your community without any words? Go home, take pictures, find the smallest little detail of something that you think is cool, start documenting your community, start finding those areas that you think you can improve. Start talking about it with one another. And sure enough, you'll find it will be place making not that long. <laughs>
Do we do local outreach? Yeah. It's really real estate agents, so that they've got access to the resources you would like them to share. Yes. We, as a committee, we're, we're working with the, with the city and trying to get them on our, um, with Mindy to work through the planning, through the Tallahassee communications and, and things like that. But yes, it, and, and, and we do, we do, uh, we've had some public workshops. I mean, when we do um, things like uh, when we do the management plan, we had people come and we talked to them. And, uh, but it, it's, I mean, it, it's a real estate thing. I mean, you can't, you know, there's a talk, well, do you make a law that says they have to do this, you, you know, or what's the right way? But it's education. It's not, first of all, just from, as, a, as a former realtor, it's really not their job to do that. Um, with all due respect, it, it opens the doorway for a lot of other mm -hmm. institutions and agencies to set expectations for people who are truly busier than the dickens most, most of the time. And I guess uh, just, just one other question and I'll be quiet. Have you considered doing outreach in the individual real estate offices? I know there are some big offices here that have a lot of agents under one roof Yes, we, we have. In fact, we one of our strategies has to do with, with, with that as far as in, increasing outreach and things like that. So yes, we, we're, we're moving in that direction. You know, it, it's uh, with us, we're a revolving door sometimes where committee members come and go and things like that. And everybody brings new ideas. We, you have a chairman, you know, resign. It's, it, but and so it's it's like trying to keep everything flowing. It's like sometimes it's it's two steps forward, one step back. But there's a great ideas, and we are definitely moving in that direction. And we have strategies to, to try to increase the amount of public awareness we are doing about the uh, what can and can't happen in Canopy Roads area. Thank you very much. You sure. Just to. Uh, oh. To follow up on that, the, the Realtors Association, like just going in and talking to them for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. you know, they must have association meetings quarterly or something. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to get down you either. No, I'm hey, I, I love it. <laughs> I mean, I'm concerned. I, I live on uh, Canopy Road, on the Mississippi Road. And uh, when one of the goals was about uh, uh, you know, increasing things to do on the Canopy Road. To, to most of us, the Canopy Road is the thing to do, you know, and to have businesses along it is kind of uh, counterproductive because then you'd have more traffic coming in and out as opposed to just riding and taking them to be of being on the road. It's like being on a covered bridge. Right, really but what about road. being able, I'm not, I don't think anyone would be advocating putting a business in the Canopy Road area, but what about people's access who don't want who want to enjoy a canopy road but don't want to have to be in a vehicle? What about being able to walk through a canopy road on the on the side? What about access like that or, or ride a bike? Right. It's, it's those kind of things, you know, it's, it's, it's striking a balance because a lot of people, that's their idea. The canopy roads experience is you get in your car and you drive, but what if you had a few little, uh, maybe somewhere you saw stop or you could get out and walk along it you know, and those kind of things. So that's, it's trying to just make it more accessible to more people because if you get more people using something and liking it, they're going to take care of it. If it's something that people don't think about, if they think every time there's a storm, you know, trees are coming down, knocking down power lines, and why do we even worry about protecting trees when my, you know, I, my, my beer gets cold for three hours because, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. So, you know. Actually, uh, kind of building off of that, I'm going to throw out one question, and uh, it kind of applies to uh, actually multiple, if not all, of your presentations. Um, and it kind of came up a couple of times, but do you see a conflict between encouraging people to experience the rural areas uh, and to have, um, and at the same time also trying to protect the character and the resources in the rural areas? And how do you balance? Kind of both showing and encouraging people to experience it while protecting it. And that can be any of all. I think kind of uh, compatibility is, is kind of the key issue, right? I mean, 
we're so lucky that, that, there's, that we have distinctive communities here, right? Tallahassee sort of has a distinctive geographic area, and then there's Thomasville has a distinctive geographic area. Transport yourself down to Tampa and tell me when you've left Tampa and when you've entered Brandon and when you've entered, you can't because they just sprawl from one to the other. So I think we have to have, and we've done a good job in the rural area of having compatible uses, uses that are compatible with, with rural character, right? So the commercial uses there are uses that are used by traditional rural land uses. So I think you can have economic development uh, in a rural area, but we try and we need to ensure that it's, it's compatible with protection you know, of those rural landscapes. Yeah, and to add to that, um, a lot of people want to live out in the rural area because of that peace, the tranquility, and the, the beautiful roads. But of course, if everybody decides they want to move out there, it's obviously going to change that aesthetic. So I think it's important to put in place and keep in place, or even make stronger, like we did the rural zoning district, when those opportunities arise to protect it, um, prevent sprawl from jumping out there, or, or just removing uses from the land development code that didn't belong in there in the first place. So I think it's important. In, Unfortunately, sometimes it's a knee-jerk reaction, but uh, when I'm hearing you're, you're correct, we need to be more proactive about uh, doing some of that to further enhance and protect these areas. Yeah, one of the things we've done with the byway is we've, you know, we've really encouraged those sorts of businesses along the byway that feed into that. So we, you know, we think there's a shortage of, of outfitters along the byway. So if you wanted to rent canoes and kayaks, you know, that we seek, uh, looking for growth in those sorts of facilities and those sorts of, those sorts of things. Um, Obviously, uh, hotels and restaurants that would feed you know, and house the, uh, the, the drivers that come down the byway. Uh, these are things that can easily be developed that doesn't have a big, huge impact on the, uh, on the existing uh, 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 landscape that's there. But, you know, you know again, the, the whole idea is to, is to help preserve this and find ways to generate an economic um, impact, a positive economic impact, while still preserving this and being the reason that, that people want to come here and, and, uh, and visit. Okay, questions back. Um, I have one comment about the rural, um, and then I have another question. Um, so one of the things that Lynn County has done, um, we haven't quite made a change yet, but I think I already proposed it, that we have this area between the rural lands and what we call our urban services boundary. The urban services boundary, the area inside is really suburbia urban. Um, and it's called in the fringe at the moment, but we're about to change the name, I hope, to rural residential. And the very use of that language means that if you want to live rural, this is a place you can live, and you live a little closer together than you do in the rural areas. Um, there's a lot of lots of different sizes. But you also have some of the conveniences of being a little bit more suburban without wanting to bring that to your rural area when you finally get really tired of driving 20 minutes every day to get a, you know, some milk. So I think that's a really important planning tool, that you create rural areas in a rural area, not intended for residential, you can put a house there, but then you have a place where you can live pseudo-rural and still not demand all the urban services inside. So, I mean, I, we've done this pretty successfully. Uh, or at least I hope when we get the name change, that will help. But, um, so my question about all of you guys is that, so there's this, I think there's this entity called Visit Florida, right? They're arguing with legislature about how much money they're gonna give. And, and I just looked them up briefly, excuse me. There, there's hardly anything about what you guys said. And yet, this is when you look at North Florida, they tell you what city to go to. And yeah, Tallahassee's nice, but that's not the rural experience. It seems like to me that, and they tell you to go to Wakulla Springs. And I do know Wakulla Springs has been very successful in finally somehow, if you're a European and you get a pamphlet about going to Florida, Wakulla Springs is on it. So yep. it, it strikes me that Visit Florida ought to be helping. <laughs> North and Central Florida, the Panhandle, with getting some scenic byways on it. Um, that Tallahassee has canopy roads. I don't know, Neil, what the, whether they really need to advertise their quail hunting, but they <laughs> certainly can advertise the, the yeah. value of visiting a community that has this very rather unusual, um, wealthy but also rural use. Um, but it, I, you just sort of wonder why Visit Florida is. You read it, and it's really about the, you know Disney. Yes. And also, we've had over oh, the byway. We've had a lot of support from Visit Florida. Oh, they, okay. they uh, you know, they they publish that that supplement that goes out in some of the Sunday papers uh, mm -hmm. each, you know, a couple times a year. And we've been featured in that. Uh, I just got a, a notice that that they are now featuring a whole section. Um, the Visit Florida on um, accessible activities, 
And so it, should, we got, it should be on their website because you know, I mean, right. You, right? When I plan a trip someplace outside the, the here, I look up things on the website, right? And yeah. you look up what you know the Chamber of Commerce and the, the tourist communities. I just don't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah we've had we've, we've had great help from 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 yeah. visit far also from visit Tallahassee and the, uh, the the tourist development councils in both Waco and Franklin County. Okay, they've been really supportive. Yeah, so, even yeah. even the big events that go on annually here in our community, those get a lot of attention from groups like that, and that's great. But it's also I mean, Jen was speaking to place making. I think some of the events that go on out there, more people would come to them if they knew about them. So I think it's getting the word out of these events, which these guys are doing a great job of doing, and actually developing into more than just having an annual event. Other things can blossom off of that. So I think it's important to get those connections down, even on a smaller rural community type level, is important and sustaining some of these areas. Well, and to that end, I just want to add, you know. We can't look to, to visit Florida or somebody else to carry the burden of our marketing, our, our assets, our little places. I mean, it should be on us to talk to one another, um, tell each other about, oh, this awesome boat ramp, or if you go here and watch the sunset at this point in time, you'll see that. You know, it's up to us to, to really take pride in our community and share it with one another. I just don't want them to ignore us. I want them to know when I, when I look at the website for Visit Florida and I look for North Central Florida, I want to see the byway there, yeah. not just for folks. You know, I want to see the camping roads. That's, I mean, it's more like, yeah, we can talk all we want among ourselves, but part of the way that this works is that the rest of the world knows a little bit about us and when they think about Florida. And, you know, we'll worry later about if we get overrun with too many tourists. You know? <laughs> I've been really impressed with the, the job that a lot of our local, especially our rural local communities, and since I cross state lines, I mean, half my work in Georgia, half in Florida, uh, I've been really impressed with the job that the local governments have done taking on responsibility for <laughs> promoting their distinctive sense of place. Um, you know, I'm really familiar with Thomas, we spent a lot of time there. I mean, they, they have fully embraced that they are a very unique community for all the following reasons, right? And people now are frequently travel up, and 80% of the business in Thomasville, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, is from where? It's from Tallahassee, it's in Florida. So it's going up there. Monday through Thursday, 80% is local. Uh, even Monticello here in Jefferson County is really beginning taking on, they want to become like a little foodie place, right? And so we hosted a dinner that you were at, and it was 250 people, and our caterer was Jefferson County, right? We tried to do it five years ago, we couldn't. Now we've got two caterers in Jefferson County. So I think we're starting to see more and more that our, our, our rural communities are sort of you know, really focusing on why they're so distinctive and different from the bigger cities. And I just think that's fantastic. Yeah, I think some of these social media platforms, and I like the plugs with the hashtag, I think that's helping get the word out. That's really important. And uh, using that as a vehicle to get the word out is, is going to help a lot of these places grow. Mm -hmm. I think this is a good opportunity for a shout out to Leon County having visited Tallahassee. I believe I'll put a member of the Big Things Big Things Bar. Bar, sure. And uh, if you want, you can plug the, the website for the Big Things Bar. Sure, Florida's Big Things City Byway dot com dot org or dot info. Florida Big Things City Byway. Uh, do we have any other questions? Well, I just want to comment your idea about, about you know, using farms and um, places like that. Like right now, uh, uh, the child's are under blueberry thing. That brings a lot of traffic out. People riding out on beautiful spring day, years, and, uh, and and that's quite a little operation. If you've never been there, it's pretty cool thing. Did you believe in fun? Just question here, and then we'll be. Sorry. Um, I just was wondering, who all lives in Woodbridge County? Yeah. Yeah. Why are you here having this in Woodville? Because <laughs> there's not, like we have a library now, which is awesome. It is. But there is no connection for Woodville people to try to get things done in Woodville. And our county commissioners, they're not too responsive. So I was just kind of curious if there was any other Woodville community activists coming here. So thank you. Let's go. Sounds like a job for a sense of place. What do you want to see? <laughs> what, do you, what, what do you see? And you're you're only going to ride a bike or walk on Oak Ridge Road because it's really dangerous and you're going to get people have to down there. It's a necessity because some people don't have cars. And it's like, the, the City County Greenways Master Plan. I know it's, it's in there. Yeah. Right, it's the part of that trail, but when is that going to happen? Well, in 10 years. 
Like, so I was just kind of curious. That's the thing. Like the uh, bike until they change it. You know, that's cool. Yeah, I just got there with like, orange cones and like big road bike lane. Well, I drive down up this road and. It's a narrow road. It's narrow. There's no shoulder. No shoulder. No shoulder. Um, okay. There's a so there's, line curve on it. There's yeah. going to be a new roundabout that's going to open and sweep down there, which is great. And there's like little pieces of sidewalks around. Anyway, I was just wondering, you know, as far as trying to connect to people in the building this year that I could talk to. So that's it. You know, four years ago, um, I had someone write to me saying, uh, oh, you live in Woodville. Um, that's one of the, uh, the places you have to drive to to get to a decent seating restaurant. And, you know, I mean, that was, that's the way it was 40 years ago. But, you know, we, we really have to come up quite a bit. And we have this wonderful community center. And uh, we have soccer fields. And we have baseball fields. <laughs> so maybe things will, you know, pick up. We also have the library put on some kind of a festival this last year. I was on this. We do have a blueberry farm later season, the oh, red barn. We also have a canopy road out here that wasn't mentioned, and really they're starting to keep it clean, and that is wonderful. Is it actually officially designated? No. no. Then that's the special sure. that makes you guys go. Oh, but the other thing is, you know, there's a huge amount of money in blueprint that was that went to placing. And I don't know that you guys didn't get that opportunity in 2014 when the Citizens Committee was making the list. But there's, that money is fungible in some ways, about being able to speak to a number of placemaking components in it. I would encourage you, if your local commissioners don't do it, there's two at large commissioners. And both Nick and Marianne will pay attention, that I would go to them and talk to them. Because I would say Woodville has assets, but it could look a lot better. It could yeah. have <laughs> stuff that made it look more like a place than a spot on the road. Right. And that's what the blueprint placemaking money has done for large parts of urban Tallahassee. But go to the at-large commissioners if you can't get Jimbo Jackson and Bill Proctor to pay attention. And those two at-large, talk to them about this. Woodville is a big community within, within the uptown. I'll have to say Marianne always answers me. She's really good. But talk specifically. Talk to them about the blueprint placemaking money. And Adam, Autumn Calder, is that, is that right, guys? She's yeah. the head of blueprint? Mm -hmm. So, you know. They do, they do much space. They do the million dollar place making stuff, which might start with small things, but well, allows you to really work But it does, and that is the essence of place making. It's developing the place that you are with the community that's there. What are the things that you want to see improved? How do you want it to look? How would you like to show it to somebody else? It starts there. It starts with you. It starts with the ideas that you have and what you guys can pull together. We have time for one more question, uh, though I do encourage you, uh, especially the contingent from Woodville here, to maybe see if you can talk to uh, Jeanette or, or Forrest or both um, kind of afterwards. So feel free to continue the conversation. Uh, we have one question here. Just a quick one is for you, Arnie. Okay. You mentioned uh, at the beginning of the program that 66% of Leon County is rural. Are you talking about land maps as opposed to population? That's correct. I don't know what percentage of the population is lives in rural areas. I do not have that statistic off the top of my head. I bet it's less than 10%. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll go back and talk to you about it, actually. That would be interesting. Yeah. Uh, as we wrap up, uh, if you did not sign in when you come in, I encourage you to do that. Uh, if you are a planner who has the uh, American Institute of Certified Planners certification and you want uh, continuing education credits for that, uh, there's a sign in uh, over on the little bar thing over there. Uh, you can actually get credits for that. Uh, grab some pretzels on your way out. Uh, there's also some postcards, so if you have some thoughts that uh, you'd like to share with us and maybe you have the opportunity to, I encourage you to write that on the postcard in the mailbox. Uh, thank you so much for attending.